Welcome, uh, Mayor Endicott here today. He's going to talk a little bit about ballot measures and just maybe some current things that are going on in town. So, welcome. Well, thank you. Well, I can uh, go over a lot of things. First thing I'd like to do is uh, talk about some events this week. Of course, as Ann's already pointed out, it's election season. <coughs> Um, I'm actually fortunate enough to be running unopposed for the fourth time. So my wife asked me the other day, she said, uh, why is that happening? <laughs> I said, well, think about it for a minute. And I said, you know, I am pretty wonderful. <laughs> she said, I think it's because no one else is crazy enough to want the job. So I leave it up to you to make a decision on which end of that spectrum you want to go to and where in the middle. You're wonderful, George. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> So anyway, uh, we have fun with some of that, but we all know if our spouses have a way of keeping us humble. So uh, she does a great job. <laughs> yeah, great lady. Um, anyway, it's election season. I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, go to RPA, Redmond Proficiency Academy, on Monday. Uh, Jeff... Uh, Government Matt. teacher? Matt. Uh, Matt. 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 He invited me over, so... Um, I went to all four classes. I was over there for four hours in the middle, got to do a ribbon cutting. And um, it was great. You know, I just love the kids. I think a lot of you know that one of my passions is getting our youth involved in our community. I always talk about it. I mean, it's maybe a little trite, but the youth are our future, which is true. And so if those that want to get involved, I'm certainly willing to work with them. And um, I have now... Um, <clears throat> put uh, a youth on every one of our committees and commissions. And that's an interesting dynamic to watch because the first meeting or so, they're quite bashful, you know, shy and kind of a little bit stand back. But when they pipe up once, then the ice is broken. And trust me, the kids are great because, you know, it, it, I mean, I look around the room, certainly the color of my hair, I mean, I don't have the perspective they do. You know, they bring something, I mean, these two young men here bring something to the table that I can't. And so it's great to have the youth involved in our committees and commissions. I was actually working on trying to get one as a, um, an ex officio member of the city council. And um, I talked to our city attorney. It turns out we cannot, by charter, <coughs> only people on the council at any level have to be elected. And so I couldn't... Um, I couldn't get a youth on the council and would have to do a charter change, which would be, you know, a little bit difficult. But one of those things about opening up a charter, if you open it up, you open it up. And that can be a dangerous undertaking. I want you to take the lid off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you take the lid off and Pandora comes out. Yeah, so uh, anyway, but so my choice then, and it's working out very well, is to put a youth on every one of the committees and commissions. And uh, they're quite engaged. They're, they're smart. And, uh, it, it, and offer, as I said, a different perspective. So that, that's a good thing. And then yesterday, we had a forum. Ann was there, uh, along with Ed Onimus. Uh, as you know, you know, we're pretty much volunteers. I mean, we get a small stipend to, to do the work, but we certainly aren't on salary or paid, and, but per se. And so, you know, people have to work. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to be retired. But a lot of the folks that are on, are on council, <coughs> So only two of the four were able to make it, and Ed actually had to take time off from work to do it. So we had two of the four there, but it was great fun. We had about 50 or so kids in the audience. We held it at Redmond High, and I've been trying to do that every election cycle, again, as part of that youth engagement and involvement, is to have at least one election forum at one of the schools. And so uh, we had quite a mix. We, we had uh, kids yesterday from all three schools there. Redmond High, Ridgeview, and RPA, and so it, it was good, and they asked some pretty insightful questions, and uh, uh, I was glad to see it. So that is, as far as things are going in town, you, you all know, I mean, I'll just remind you, you know, Oregon's rules are a little different than some states in that your ballot must be in the ballot box by 8 p.m. We have, of course, mail-in vote here or drop-off. Um, we don't have polls. So uh, a postmark is not good enough for you. The ballot has to be in the hands 
of the elected uh, election officials at 8 p.m. on the 4th. So if any of you uh, last minute uh, want to do it, the, the, in Redden now the ballot box is over by the library um, off the edge of the parking lot drop box. <coughs> no longer in Seattle, which it was for many years. And don't ask me why it changed, because I don't know. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is, is, is take questions. I mean, I can talk about some of the ballot measures. You know, of course, we have a Senate race up, right? We have uh, Dr. Webby and, and Senator Merkley uh, on the Senate side. We have, I think, five or six running for governor. Of course, we have two, two primary, Republican and Democrat, um, on there, Dennis Richardson and our current governor, uh, Kitzhopper. Uh, and then the others, Pacific Green Party, and I don't know, I, I, I was at a uh, forum where those guys were a couple of weeks ago, uh, the League of Oregon Cities this year, um, they had the candidates there for a luncheon in, in an hour and a half or so of forum. And boy, some of them are out there. <laughs> I tell you, you know, little scary people running for office, but anybody can run, you know, you got a few bucks and you can buy a buy a ticket to the dance, as they say, you know, if that's democracy at work. But I think uh, we humans are pretty good at filtering. So uh, we can kind of separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were, when it comes to some of those. And there were a couple of pretty chaffy people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, so that was a lot of fun. And, you know, I've stayed engaged. I think I, I might have talked to you before, but one of the things that I care about as the mayor of Redmond is to be involved at the regional and, and state level to a lesser degree national level. But, um, <clears throat> so I'm the chairman of what's called the Central Oregon Cities Organization, which uh, Moppin's included, but it's nine cities in Central Oregon that get together and we actually have lobbyists that works in Salem for us because some of our issues are not the same as the valley. I mean, you know, the, the whole land use thing, and we've been fighting quite a while to get some regional decision making. Uh, one of my teas about is farmland. If you, if you look at Oregon land use law, the idea is that um, the primary role, as far as they're concerned, the, the LCDC, Land Conservation and Development Commission, notice the first word is conservation, not development. And that's an Oregon tenant, as I'm sure you all know. And so what happens is the idea is to preserve farmland and forest land, or what they call resource land. I am fond to remind the director uh, of land conservation and development that while the topsoil in the valley is measured in feet, ours is measured in inches. And uh, when we were doing our urban growth boundary amendment a few years ago over here on the west side of the highway, Two or three of the farmers over there along Hemholtz, you know where those alfalfa farms are, one of them told me their average soil depth was four inches. I mean, you know, so, so what do you have to do? You have to pour tons of water on it. And, and you think about the dichotomy. I was asking the director, and I said, you've got a dilemma. And he goes, what's that? I said, well, you talk about preserving resources, water, and preserving farmland. I said, but to preserve that farmland, you have to go through tons of water to get anything to grow on it. So take your pick, water or land, because they're dichotomous in our case. It's not like the valley where the, you know, the soil's feet thick and it's that beautiful dark loam soil. You know, we have this four inches of sand. And uh, so anyway, it, they don't like to confront issues like that where they have an intractable choice. But I've been working very hard trying to get some regional decision making. And actually, um, I've been one of the primary movers. I'm also on the local officials advisory committee to the, the uh, LCDC. And I've been hitting them very hard. And there are actually two efforts that are regional in nature. One is allowing three counties in southern Oregon, and I think it's Curry, Douglas, oh, there's a third one. Um, that are being allowed, with help, to redefine what is resource land, okay, as an experiment, to see how that works. And of course I'm hoping it succeeds, because what, then what that means, if we can apply it statewide then, I ask them, I said, 
tell me what in the world grows on the Alvord Desert. I mean, it is rated as, as farmland. They can't grow rocks down there, you know? <laughs> and I, I mean, I'm glib and I've actually said that to them. But it, it's true, you know, things, what happened when Oregon land use law was, and if I'm off track, just throw something at me. But when, when Oregon land use law was established back in the 70s, there was a default called EFU, exclusive farm, farm use. If there was no other category, you know, residential or commercial, et cetera, it was EFU. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're, we're trying to get that redefined um, and, and look at that land and have what's a new category called non-resource land. And, and be able to not treat that as though it were some sacred cow, which is what they do in the city. Okay, enough of that. Um, what I wanted to do was talk to you today, if you will, I have brought my, my cheat sheet here, the voters pamphlet about some of the ballot titles and what they mean. Um, and some of them are pretty contentious, as we know. One that uh, I've been particularly dealing with is Prop 91, which is the the uh, recreational marijuana bill. Um, one of the worries with that bill, it was not very well done. And there are caveats in there that are going to create some real problems for, for us. The cities have taken the position through the League of Oregon Cities, and in fact the counties through the Association of Oregon Counties, that um, the state does not have the authority to tell us whether or not we can tax because the Constitution allows us to tax. But what this bill and others have done is, is try and what we call preemption, preempt the authority that we have to tax. And so half the cities, actually a few more than half, are pushing the envelope and we're all going to approve a tax on marijuana even though the bill says we can't. So we're going to force the issue and force the state legislature to address that issue. They're going to have to confront it even though they don't want to. Um, the argument by the proponents of the bill is that uh, in order to make uh, recreational marijuana affordable, uh, that it, and, and if it's, uh, uh, sorry, state taxes and then the cities and counties tax on top of that, then legal marijuana becomes unaffordable, so people are going to keep buying illegal marijuana. Well, they're going to do it anyway, actually. And it turns out medical marijuana is, is turning into kind of a problem across the state, which is already legal, and I'll talk about that one in a minute. So um, we have had a first reading and had a six to one vote in favor of taxing medical marijuana 5%. And, Recreational marijuana, 15% in Redmond. Most cities in the state have done 5 and 10. The highest is 40. Uh, the purpose being to discourage it, of course. Um, Sandy has 20. So it's all over the world. Even Portland put in a tax. So, well, that floored me. Um, ben will not, interestingly enough. Uh, most of the cities in Central Oregon are going to impose a tax. So we're going to try and force the legislature to deal with it. Um, I told you I visited a high school the other day and had kind of fun with the kids because we were talking about this. And I said, you know, one of the major problems of that bill is that anyone is allowed to own, have in their possession any one time, eight ounces. All right? Now, one ounce is a bag or some approximate equivalent. Eight ounces, according to the stuff I've read, is over 400 joints. Okay? And as I told the kids, I said, we could get the whole town stoned on one person. <laughs> so they, yeah, they got a big kick out of that. I said, that's what we need, the whole town stoned. Some guy walking down the street with a bag under his arm full of pot. And, um, but it's just kind of a crazy number. Who knows where it came from? And so uh, the good news is this is a, a law or... If it passes, it'll be a law, not a constitutional amendment, so the legislature can change it. And uh, I was talking to Senator Beyer, whose committee will have responsibility for it. 
and he already knows they have to make some changes. The other interesting thing, you'll love this one, right now the notion is that the marijuana, recreational marijuana, will be sold through the liquor stores. The bill calls for the OLCC to have management responsibility for the sale to, to be the recreational marijuana outlets, okay? So, so, you know, you think about that for a minute. So you go in there, I mean, you know, you can buy your whiskey and buy your pot and whatever on your way out the door. And I said, well, what happens if you have a liquor store owner that is philosophically opposed and he's, he's certainly willing to sell booze but chokes on the fact that marijuana is illegal federally and refuses to sell it? Then what do you got to do? So, go to Ben. Hmm? Go to Ben. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go to Ben. Yeah, you can buy it everywhere in Ben. So, um, we'll see. But that's the other issue, and, and that brings me to the second point I was going to make on the me medical side. I say we. We won a court case last week. The city of Cave Junction filed a lawsuit against the state, attorney general, governor, whoever, anyway, state government, uh, saying that the state could not force cities to allow medical marijuana dispensaries, thereby violating federal law, because marijuana is illegal federally. It is a class one drug. It's considered a dangerous drug, a la heroin, at the federal level. That was like medical or recreational? Medical. Medical's already passed. I mean, a judge won't address something that's hypothetical that doesn't exist. The medical marijuana bill has passed, and there are two bills. One approved it. We got so upset, the cities, I mean, we were beating down the door of our legislators. They put that one-year moratorium in place and said, well, we'll figure it out the next legislative session, kicking the can down the road. And so that's coming up in January. But meanwhile, <coughs> last week, Cave Jun uh, meanwhile, Cave Junction filed a lawsuit saying, look, regardless, you cannot force us to break federal law. You know, the, the Constitution has a supremacy clause. And as long as it's illegal federally, you can't make us. Now, it, here's a little nuance on this that I care an awful lot about, and that is that if, of course, the current Attorney General, he doesn't care, he violates the law all the time. But um, that was a tongue in cheek. <laughs> but he won't enforce that law, right? So he's allowing marijuana. To, to be sold illegally, you know, by federal law. And so, you know, that's created a big dilemma for us because, okay, that's us, Attorney General, but what if we get a hard nose in next time, right? They, they dig up Elliot Ness and bring him back. And so all of a sudden, then we could lose all of our federal money. Any federal grants that you have, if you're in violation of federal law, they can cut them off. So that could be to schools. It could be to, in my case, what I really worry about is the airport, shut down our towers, shut down commercial air operations if they took all the federal funding that you get to run a, a commercial airport in the United States. So, you know, this is a bigger deal than just a maybe. Yes? I really think they're going to do that in Colorado, Washington, and Oregon. Even there would be some more reasonable measure that they would take than just say, sorry, you guys. All the federal money's gone today. We're talking about three very populated states that there's no way they could get yeah. away with well, the same. Well, hypothetically, you're right, but hypothetically it could. If it I, went to that level, we'd have a lot more problems. I mean, if somebody's willing to be that heavy-handed about something that's been living as the law of the land that long, that person is basically a dictator at that level, and we've got a lot of other problems. But no, this. it's happened. All right, 1974. I don't know if you were alive then. No. But um, we had a gas crisis in the United States. A lot of you remember getting in line at 5 a.m. to oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. get gas on the odd number of days and all that stuff, depending on your license plate. I remember it. Anyway, what the federal government did said, if you want your federal highway money, you will set your, your, your drive speed limit at 55. Montana had none. Nevada had 75. Many states had 65, Texas had 75. The federal government dictated every state would make their, their speed limit 55 or they take their federal funding. There are precedents for it. Another precedent says, uh, is now in our midst with Common Core. 
if, yeah. state if you don't impose it, we're going to take your federal, your federal funding away from your school. So it does happen, it can happen, and I, I get your point. Yeah, just, the I problem is, well. it can happen, and, and my point, and I'm going to continue to argue it, is that I see no reason to put our city at risk, even hypothetically, as long as we don't have to. And the worst case scenario in that is then you shut down all of the, if they came and did say that, you would, it, you would instantly shut them down across the state, the entire state would. Close them. Yeah. In, any that have it. Uh, the other thing this court case did, and the judge, the judge had a very interesting, well, he had, he had two things he said. He said, one, that, and he would not address the federal issue, by the way, because he got around it by sticking with state issues. He said the state laws are ambiguous in that they use the word may rather than shall or must. Okay, and I don't remember the bills, but one's a House bill, one's a Senate bill. But, but they say may. You may do this, the state may do that. He said since it's so ambiguous, it's unenforceable. That was the first point he made. The second point he made was, and he actually used our friends out here, the East Fossil. He said take a small town, and he said Fossil's my example, Everyone in the state of Oregon is entitled to pharmaceuticals, right? Prescription medicine, if you need heart medicine or you need diabetic or whatever. Everyone in the state of Oregon is entitled to medicine. Everyone's entitled to a doctor. Everyone's entitled to hospitalization and surgery if they need it. But the state can't dictate that Fossil open a pharmacy because people live in Fossil that have prescriptions or they can't force Fossil to build a hospital because somebody there might need hospitalization. So he, he used that phrase they call reasonable accommodation, saying that if, even if the state tries to say that we must, the state can't say that because they don't do it in any other case. All right, is there a DMV in every town because everybody wants to get a license? You know, is there a pharmacy in every town because you have a prescription? And so that was his argument. And, and remember, we're talking about medical marijuana. So that's why he tied it to the medical world, pharmacies, hospitalization, doctors, and so And uh, Maybe you know the answer to this, but I've never understood why medical marijuana would go through these fancy dispensaries with all this variety and all this sales hoopla, rather than a pharmacy. You mentioned pharmacies. Well, it's a pain, it's a doctor prescribing. <clears throat> pain medicine, why isn't it picked up from Fred Meyer Pharmacy? It isn't a prescription. It is an authority to buy. All right, medical start. marijuana doesn't take a prescription? It's not oh, a prescription, yeah. it's a medical marijuana card that, that says fine. you have a malady and you this will help you fix it. There is no prescription that says okay. you get, you know, there's a max that you can have up to six plants, but okay. you don't get a dose of one ounce of liquid a day or something. Okay. So it's not a prescription in terms of a doctor prescribing it. Okay. Um, secondly, back to the federal law, a pharmacy by federal law cannot dispense an illegal drug. <clears throat> Pot is illegal, federally. So any pharmacist that dispensed it would lose their license, whether hypothetically or in this case really, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you know, my point in all of this, I'm sorry it takes so much time, but my point is it is so unsettled in fact, even the liberal Democrat Hippenlooper from, is that how you say Hippenlooper? From Colorado has said, don't do it. He said, we're having so much trouble. Let our system work out all the bugs before the rest of you try it. Sir. Well, they made, they were a couple of years ahead of us on medical marijuana and had medical, medical marijuana dispensaries all dispersed around the state or where the population is. And so they just turned it over and said, well, we'll put the recreational marijuana in the medical dispensaries. Well, Washington, in its wisdom, voted out its liquor stores the year before they passed legalized marijuana. So they had no foundation, secure, uh, uh, you know, people had been screened and, and fine, you know, all their finances generated and all that kind of stuff before. So they were just, that's why they've been such a big pickle. Mm -hmm. The other thing that gets to me is here is really comes down to is whether or not the city council will allow there to be a dispensary within the city limits at all. Right, and we for now have a moratorium. Okay. We don't allow them. Ben does allow them. 
Um, you know, there are other issues with it in terms of what they're trying to do is say, well, you know, you, you must allow them, which I just talked about, that will no longer hold because of the court case. But um, you can do what they call reasonable accommodation in that you can say they have to be so far from a school, so far from, you know, uh, where kids gather apart, all that kind of stuff. Certain towns, of course, small communities, you draw those circles and there's nowhere for those dispensaries to go. And depending on, uh, I was talking to the mayor of, I think it was Gresham, and they were going to make the circles 2,000 feet, which limited it to about one block in their industrial area. <laughs> so, George, some of the argument, though, that I'm hearing is, you know, that people are saying because it's illegal on the federal level, you know, on the federal level, if I understand correctly, um, when we are talking about taxation and treatment of spouses of same or differing sexes, there still is federal law regarding how we can be treated for tax purposes, and it's essentially in one way or another not legally protected to be a same-sex couple on the federal level. Is it then okay on a state level for a state not to choose on their own to, to make those decisions because there could be long-term some damages that could come back? Was that an argument ever made in the same, with those same issues as they arose with the same-sex marriage, protection of marriage at all? No, I'm with you. And, and I, I think the real answer there is that th there are two aspects to that. One, one is that um, the Supreme Court just recently refused to hear appellate court decisions that have nationwide now, for all intents and purposes, same-sex marriage is legal. Because the the, all of the appellate courts have said it was, and the Supreme Court wouldn't hear it. Secondly, the Attorney General wouldn't enforce, you're talking about, what's it, what was that law called? The uh, Preservation of Marriage, marriage Act. Protection of Marriage, marriage Act. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Attorney General wouldn't enforce it anyway, right? And so now, I mean, effectively, same-sex marriage is legal. But only because of treatment, not because of statute, correct? Correct. Same as what we're dealing with. Well, but law. well, if you think about it, once a statute is found invalid, then it no longer exists, right? I think his point, though, is that the defense of marriage, the that's it. The defense of that came up through uh, through state action, similar to what states are trying to do about marijuana. So essentially, it's a grassroots campaign. Everything that happened with with giving equal rights to um, same-sex marriages happened through states going against what federal government said. Right. So let's just remember how this all has to happen. Just because the federal government tells us something, if we don't agree on a local level, the only way we can is on a local level making a decision. I don't care what the federal government has to say personally. Yeah. And you know, I think we all have a better decision to make, just like you talk about with land use. Would you like to give the rights of our land use to the federal government? And if they had statutes that were against what we had to say, would we not rise up and say that we have other thoughts about it? and maybe even make laws counter to what they say. Well, they do. I mean, look at EPA and clean water and, um, you know, what, what's a navigable waterway and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they're trying to say intermittent streams now are protected under EPA rules. Um, you know, I don't know where you go with that. I mean, we can talk about it forever, depending on what the, what the subject is. But there are certain things, and, and in terms of land use, believe it or not, land use law emanates from the 1930s federal law, yeah. in fact. Um, the, but that law gives every state, is all it says is every state has to address land use. It doesn't really say how. Other things obviously are very specific, like you're referring to that includes the how. Um, you know, the no child left behind and some of the new stuff with Common Core is very, uh, it, it's, well, I use the word dictatorial. By that I mean it's dictated to us on what we must do. So I don't know what the right answer is. Yes? I got to put in my two cents here. I think we forget the fact that marijuana is scientifically an addictive drug and it's harmful and it produces uh, damage down to the molecular and nuclear level and it is already classified as a class one drug uh, by the DEA. Uh, it's illegal to sell it without a prescription according to the protocol that goes along with class one and class two uh, DEA classified drugs. It requires a, pres a prescription uh, to dispense it. 
And uh, I think it should be left there. I don't think it should be left up to, well, in this instance, medical marijuana. Yeah, we'll agree with that. But recreational marijuana is a different animal. It's the same damn animal. And really, to justify whether it's because you want more taxes or because you want your own hive and your own, your own uh, uh, entitlement to do what you want, which I agree with in principle. But when it comes to uh, public hazard, then one's individual principle has to give over to the wealth of the, of the whole. I, I think, think that so, George, anybody that says that has to believe that alcohol has to be immediately prohibited. Immediately, if we believe that. Because alcohol is at least as damaging, if not more, than marijuana. And personally, I think we have to look at cigarettes, we have to look at alcohol, we have to look at everything else that has been legalized, but known to be harmful. In, in more than a little way. So it's one o'clock right now. Maybe just give um, Mayor a chance to make a closing statement if he has one, or? Yeah, well, I, you know, <laughs> let me say, obviously there are, there are things on the ballot this time that are provocative, right? <laughs> um, this being one, and, and probably the most contentious. It'll be interesting, the, the last polls I saw was uh, 51 in favor, 42 against. So we'll see what happens. Um, in favor of passage? Yes. Yeah, now, uh, remember the position I took was that if it does pass, the cities want to preserve their constitutional right to tax it because we know there are going to be impacts, you know, the equivalent of DUIs. And, and um, you know, I told these kids the other day, I said, look, I said, I was 18 once I was in college. I had 21-year-old friends. You think I couldn't get my hands on beer? You're darn right I could. And the same thing's going to happen with this, even though, in theory, it's restricted to 21-year-olds. It's not going to stay there. Kids can already get it. It is now. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Anyway, um, thank you all very much. Uh, have fun. Vote, please. I won't tell you to vote early, vote often, but I'll tell you to please vote. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we don't live in Chicago. <laughs> By the way, did you hear about the machine? A Republican went in to vote yesterday and the machine switched yep. his vote to Democratic, yep. to his opponent, and... What? Where was uh, that at? In Chicago! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you all very much. So remember, ballots in by 8 p.m. on the 4th in a ballot box, not postmarked. Thank you all for inviting me. Thank you.